Susan Wild, Congresswoman from Pennsylvania, your office put out a press release that says there's an attack on reproductive freedom in the United States. Tell us more. Sure, I'd be happy to, and thank you very much for, for having me. Um, the attack on, on women's reproductive rights, which, by the way, are, are on couples' reproductive rights, to be perfectly honest, um, has been um, going on for a very long time, and it culminated in the Supreme Court decision of Dobbs, which curtailed um, the right to uh, have an abortion for women and over overturned uh, what had been settled law in the United States for 50 years, um, set forth in Roe versus Wade and, and subsequent cases. And um, the Dobbs decision, which is now, I think, two years old plus, um, immediately paved the way for states to um, enact very, very restrictive laws um, restricting the right to have an abortion. And it has resulted in some states creating um, laws that literally make it impossible to get an abortion uh, after a woman knows that she's pregnant because the restrictions are such that she wouldn't even know that she is pregnant before that period of time that she's allowed to have one is, um, is up. And it has continued to just um, create a crisis in the field of obstetrics and gynecology. I've spoken to a number of physicians in that field who are very, very worried about it. We are facing a shortage of people going into that field because of the Dobbs decision. Um, and by the way, it's not because they want to go in that field just so that they can perform abortions. They also are the ones that take care of women's gynecologic care and, and help them give birth to babies. So this is a true crisis. But for women generally in this country, what we are seeing is that not all women um, have equal rights in the United States. It very much depends on the state that you live in, whether you are going to have control over your own body. And that is a real pressing and urgent need. Uh, Congresswoman, in vitro fertilization is getting a lot of attention lately. First, uh, tell us, what is your basic understanding of that process? Well, thanks for that question, because I think it's really important for people to understand it. Um, if you haven't had to go through it or have a family member who's gone through it, chances are you just know the initials as IVF and know that it's some sort of assisted fertility technique. And what it is... It's, it's a last resort, frankly, for couples who have been trying to get pregnant for a very, very long time and have already exhausted other uh, fertility treatments, uh, usually. There are some people who will go directly to IVF, uh, mostly people who are undergoing chemo treatments for cancer and, and that kind of thing and are told that they need to harvest their eggs or their sperm, as the case may be. And so what happens is the female the female's ovaries are hyperstimulated with medication. She then produces far more than the usual number of eggs that would be pr produced in a menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and those eggs are extracted from her body. Those eggs are then inseminated or fertilized by semen, mm -hmm. sperm, um, outside of the uterus. And they are permitted to grow until they form embryos. Those embryos, some of them, not it doesn't always take, are then suitable for transplantation into the woman's uterus um, in the hopes of carrying a pregnancy to term. Now, let me just hasten to add, that is my very unscientific explanation that comes after uh, much reading and lots of discussion with people who have gone through it as well as physicians. But that's to some extent, what it's all about. Well, Congresswoman, you said that in vitro fertilization is a last resort. What is the rate of success for in vitro fertilization or IVF on the first attempt? Well, that number's actually been growing steadily over the last 15 years. Um, I actually experienced my own fertility issues. I did not have to go the IVF route because, I, but I, I was eventually successful in having two wonderful children, but that was 30 years ago. And um, they did IVF in those days, but the rate of success was much, much lower. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know the exact number, but I, and I would defer to an expert on that, but I have been told that it is increasingly more um, successful. And 
virtually everyone I know who has gone through the IVF process, and that number's in the dozens, has succeeded, not necessarily on the first attempt, and I can't speak to that, mm-hmm. but at some point through the IVF process, has succeeded in actually carrying a child or children. Uh, what happens to the embryos that don't work with IVF? So, as I mentioned before, um, the the specialist, the medical specialist, then implants embryo or embryos into the uterus. Uh Um, My understanding is that they generally implant more than one in the hopes that at Uh least one will take. That sometimes results in multiple pregnancies and they won't, they won't, they won't put too many embryos in um, for that reason. Um, So, but there are, because of the process of hyperstimulating the ovaries and extracting the eggs and having them inseminated, there are going to be extra embryos in many cases. Mm -hmm. And those are generally frozen until the uh, couple or woman decides whether they want to have more children. If they do want to, they can go back and use one or more of those embryos without having to go through the what is a very long and painful process of, of hyperstimulating the ovaries and extracting them. Um, but in some cases, the embryos are not later used. And um, what happens to those embryos, frankly, is dependent on what the couple or woman want to do. Um, some people opt to preserve them for a very long period of time, either for future use, possibly for benevolent purposes. But um, if they choose to do that, it is at their own expense that they have to preserve them. And then sometimes these embryos are are, are discarded. Um, it, some t- occasionally, it, it, they are, IVF is used, um, in fact, more than occasionally. Often it is used by people who know they carry some genetic illness. And so that in that case, the embryo w- or embryos would be tested to find out if that genetic disease exists. The embryos that do carry it would generally be discarded or, mm-hmm. again, left up to the choice of the couple as to whether to use them or not. Um, so, it, And then other times they simply have more embryos than are necessary, and those would be discarded. Well, Representative, I know that you know about the development in the Alabama court that ruled that embryos are children. So what do you think uh, of that development and the effect on your agenda of that court ruling? So the Alabama decision, which came down, I believe, in late January of this year, 2024, Um, was very alarming, but not entirely unexpected. Um, I frankly had anticipated exactly this kind of thing, although frankly I thought it would come out of a legislature, a state legislature, rather than out of a court, um, back when the Dobbs decision was made. But it immediately quelled any ability to pursue IVF in Alabama. And that included people who were in the process I mentioned before this that it's not it, it's not a once and done the kind of thing. Um, so women who were, had actually already had their ovaries hyperstimulated and were awaiting extraction or had had the extraction done, um, literally um, had to stop because the clinics all stopped doing what they were were doing in response to mm-hmm. that Alabama court decision. Mm-hmm. So very traumatic. Uh, Representative, the debate continues then uh, in general about when life begins, doesn't it? Well, the debate continues. Um, Obviously, I serve in a Congress where um, the GOP has passed a bill, has not gone any further, but um, to determine that life begins at the moment of conception, which would mean that these embryos that I just described, which are nothing more than uh, an egg that has been fertilized by a sperm, um, are, are a life, and w- you would not be able to use IVF. And so um, that's the debate that, you know, there are a large number of um, politicians who have taken up that, that um, uh, claim of life beginning at conception. There are um, interest groups that are backing them. There are also interest groups that are fighting any politician, especially on the GOP side, who tries to do anything that would further the cause of IVF um, or women's reproductive rights. And it is 
Um, here we are all these years later after this wonderful medical technology has been de developed, mm -hmm. um, finding that that something that has given people the ability to, to have a family for, for a very long time now may very well be taken away depending on the state they live in. So Representative, let's get down to the main reason we have you here today, which is to talk about your bill, the could remove obstacles for women who want IVF, and, and just how would you do that exactly? So um, I have to go backwards a little bit and let you know that when I said that it wasn't entirely unexpected when I saw the Alabama court decision, because back when the Dobbs decision was decided, my thoughts after I read the entire opinion over and over um, were that IVF was very much going to be a target. And mm -hmm. Justice Thomas made that absolutely clear in his wording, in his opinion. Um, and so I went back to my team in Washington and said, I want to start working on an IVF bill to codify at a federal level the right to undergo IVF treatment. Mm -hmm. And so we started working on it. And it took a, quite a long time. It takes a long time to prepare a bill and make sure that it's going to pass constitutional muster and so forth. And then in January of 2024, we actually um, filed the bill. And um, within a matter of weeks, the Alabama decision came down. And the mm -hmm. bill that I introduced is called the Access to Family Building Act. Um, and I had specifically devised it because I knew it was only a matter of time before politicians that were intent on controlling women's bodies we're going to come for fertility treatments. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. my my worst fear came true. So uh, what do you uh, see in the immediate future then, given these developments this year uh, for your bill? Well, let me just say, I have received so much outreach from people, ordinary people, not politicians, about this bill. Um, and that includes people on both sides of the aisle, and, and it also includes people who don't really have any political persuasion, mm -hmm. um, talking to me about their own experience with IVF. And, it, you know, it, it is not a partisan bill at all. So when I introduced it, the very first thing we did was um, work on getting co-sponsors. We had actually worked on looking for a re Republican co-sponsor in that intervening year before mm -hmm. we actually dropped the bill. Um, we came close, but it didn't quite work out. So I just decided that I wanted to get that bill filed. Um, we were successful in getting four Republicans, at least as of the last time I checked, to uh, sign on to the bill as co-sponsors. We have 188 mm -hmm. Democratic co-sponsors and four Republicans. And um, that's the current status of the mm -hmm. bill. Given that uh, my party is not in the majority, we don't right. control what comes to the floor for a vote, but I am going to do everything I can to get this bill across the finish line because I am convinced based on what I've heard, the outreach I've heard both from men, women, doctors, and so forth, that at grandparents, by the way, Mitt Romney famously said, I would have fewer grandchildren if it were not for IVF. And I often mm -hmm. mention that because I want people to understand that this is this cons this involves families, extended families. And so because I don't see any prospect of the Speaker of the House, the current Speaker of the House, bringing this to the House floor for a vote um, right ahead of World IVF Day last month, I introduced what's called a discharge petition to force a vote and a discharge petition if you can get 218 signatures of members of Congress, um, the speaker is forced to put the bill up for a vote. Mm -hmm. It's not done very often. It's not done very often successfully. It's actually happened in connection with a bill led by a Republican earlier this year, having nothing to do with this, having to do with um, uh, disaster relief. Um, but it doesn't happen very often. But if you can get to that 218 magic number, mm -hmm. um, we will be able to force a vote on the House floor. And that's where I'm hoping to be right now. Well, as I said, a, a representative, a representative, our time is limited. Try to highlight one specific protection, the way it's articulated in the bill that our viewers can take away from this interview, please. So I think the most important protection is that it preserves and and it explicitly states the right to use in vitro fertilization and other 
assisted reproductive uh -huh. treatments. Um, and that's and it does it at a federal national level. And that's very important because we don't want a situation where women have to go from state to state in, in search of being able to have this done. Be, having fertility issues, and I can tell you from firsthand experience, is traumatic enough. You don't need the added burden of having to find a doctor or a clinic in another state. And then because it's a protracted process, traveling back and forth to that state to have it done. Mm -hmm. um, and as we've seen with abortion, states are enacting laws that, that impose criminal penalties on women who mm -hmm. try to cross straight lo state lines for reproductive care. And so I think it's just incredibly important and would be absolutely groundbreaking for us to create this federal right. Our last question, Representative, why was it important to you personally to take up this cause? Well, I have so many people in my personal circle, family and friends, who have under, either undergone IVF themselves um, or their children have or their grandchildren have and have gone on to have... Um, you know, wonderful families, thanks to it. I've also been there first myself, but also with these friends and family as they've undergone infertility, which is an absolutely devastating thing for any person to go through when they have reached that point in their life where they've decided they want to have a child. And so that, it, it was personal experience. It was talking to people that I knew and just my history of experience with, with many people in my circle who had undergone it. All right, Susan Wild, Congresswoman from Pennsylvania. Thank you very much. Thank you.